It's time for Tweet This Week in Tech, a big week, and we've got the best here to talk about it. Denise Howell from This Week in Law, Natalie Morris from NBC, and, of course, Tim Stevens from CNET. We'll talk about the Supreme Court Aereo decision, Google I.O., and a new world record in Super Mario. It's all coming up next. Tweet. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit This Week in Tech, episode 464, recorded June 29th, 2014. My Wi Fi Moomoo. This Week in Tech is brought to you by lynda.com. Learn what you want, when you want, with access to over 2,400 high-quality online courses, all for one low monthly price. To try it free for seven days, visit lynda.com slash twit2. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash twit and the number two. And by NatureBox. Order great-tasting healthy snacks delivered right to your door. Forget the vending machine. Get in shape with healthy, delicious treats like roasted garlic pumpkin seeds. <laughs> to get 50% off your first box, go to naturebox.com slash twit. That's naturebox.com slash twit. And by Personal Capital. With Personal Capital, you'll finally have all your financial life in one place and get a clear view of everything you own. Best of all, it's free. To sign up, go to personalcapital.com slash twit. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we take all the tech news of the week, we masticate, we genuflect, we eradicate, I don't know, we do a bunch of stuff to it and we spit it out in your, in your, in your little bird-like mouth. <laughs> Joining... <laughs> <laughs> we regurgitate. That's the regurgitation. Bravo, sure. Thank you. That's Natalie Morris, who is A plus in bird biology. Natalie's a contributor to Perhaps. NBC, a longtime friend of the show, many times on the show. It's great to have you back. Looks like you're in Thank Lake you. Tinky Winky. No, I'm not. Oh, you're home. I'm in I'm in New Jersey. Why are you not at Lake Tinky Winky on this fourth of New July Jersey. weekend? Well, you know, my husband works for a news channel, so when it's a holiday for everyone else, it's usually not for us. So he works when there's holidays. I, as a longtime broadcaster, I always work holidays and weekends. It's yeah, terrible. Yeah. It's horrible. You don't have, yeah, you don't have them off. No. But don't cry for me, Argentina, because <laughs> I get to be on Twitch. Actually, uh, Argentina plays tomorrow, I think, so don't worry about that one. Uh, also here, Denise Howell wearing her EFF t-shirt. She's, of course, the host of This Week in Law, blogger at Bags and Baggage, and we just love Denise. Uh, Hi, it's great to be back. A practicing working attorney on the show. What a thought. Yes. That's why you're here today, because the Supreme Court's been busy and we need your help. They have been busy. <laughs> we also welcome Tim Stevens from Engadget. Uh, I'm sorry, CNET. Oh. There you go. Rewind. <laughs> I was living in the past. It's, it's only been a year now, Leo. <laughs> One of these days, I'll figure it out. <laughs> you can rewind a little bit and give me the CNET title. You both. And give him. We, we're mm -hmm. with, had you ever worked for CNET, uh, Denise? We'll have the... Because I worked for CNET, too. Uh, I worked for ZDNet well. I blogged for them. That's close so that, enough. That's, that's close enough, uh, right? Same... Uh, Are you part of the Facebook page? There's a ex-CNET employee Facebook page. Oh, no. I'll have to sign up. <laughs> I, would, I would win a prize because I was the fourth employee of CNET. Are you part of that page? I'll invite you. I want to be on that page because I, I was, it was um, Shelby uh, Lyman and uh, the weirdo. <laughs> and uh, who was the other guy? I've forgotten him. He got, he got in trouble with the uh, state of California for not paying his taxes. He oh, bought no. He bought a racehorse because he could, he looked it in the eyes and he could see it was a winner. Uh, I forgot his name. I can't, it, it just keeps me. You know who I'm talking about. Oh, his reputation precedes him. Yes, Halsey Minor. That's it. That's it. Yeah. And I remember he told me there uh, that Halsey Minor at the University of Virginia, there's a Halsey Hall and a Minor Hall, and they're right across the street from because <laughs> his family is an old Virginia family. He comes from money, and I was I was like the fourth employee. It was just the two of them when I was uh, hired to be the VP of programming for one week, <laughs> and. <laughs> Was out the door. <laughs> and that was it. Were you there when Ryan Seacrest was there? Oh, no, no, no. He came after me. I, I literally, I did their first pilot with Dvorak. And I mean, I go way back. But that's a long and boring story. Let's get into the news because there's a lot of it. We'll be talking about Google I.O. in a bit. And I do have the 
most valuable gimme. You know, every year at Google's developer conference, they give away notebooks, they give away phones, they give away the Google Q, which they never even sold. That's got to be worth something if you still have your Google Q. But this year, yeah, you got Android Wear watches, sure. But more to the point, you got cardboard. Mm. You have yours, Tim, because you were at Google I.O. I do, yeah. Uh, I actually haven't opened mine yet, so it's still in the folded up form, totally unopened. I'm going to shrink wrap that thing. I'm going to go down to the comic book store and get one of those um, acid-free uh, baggies, I think, and put it in there. You should. Store it for a couple of decades. It's, uh, we just checked on eBay, uh, 86 bucks for Google Cardboard unopened. Assembled, I think, is going to have le it's less valuable, but unopened. I actually did run out of them. I know some people who were at the keynote who came out the door too late and weren't <laughs> able to get them. So you did have to get out there early. Oh, I got mine. Gina and Jeff were there. I wasn't there, but they gave me mine. This was, this was a flat piece of cardboard. Gina took the time to assemble it in the car right up here. It's got a little magnet thing on the side with a rubber band. It's got some uh, plastic lenses. That's the only thing that would be hard to get. They do have the plans online. And then you could either go to a website or download on the Google Play Store the free cardboard app. You put on your smartphone, it has to be an Android phone, you put the smartphone in here. It senses that it's in the box. <laughs> and it gives, you, it gives you a VR view. And I think the whole thing is that for a buck fifty, they made something that's worth, that does the same thing Oculus Rift does for $2 billion. <laughs> Because it does. It's stereo. It's pretty, pretty impressive. It's actually it, it's better. Pretty great how they were able to pull that together for something so cheaply. And people were very excited to see it. I mean, I tweeted when I got mine, and I don't know how many hundred retweets I got out of that thing. But, yeah, it, it is an interesting way to, to get VR in the hands of more people. I mean, people have certainly heard about VR for a long time, and not everyone has had the chance to try out Oculus. And, you know, this isn't as good as Oculus, but it's certainly I think it's close. better than Oculus. How is it not really? as good? So here's oh, a stereo. First of all, Oculus. Oculus. Well, this is. Okay, so. It's using an Android phone. Apparently, that's enough compute power to do what Oculus does. This is this was the very fun thing they put out in the Moto X, where it's a game where you look around and you follow a hat. It's called Windy Day. But if you put it in here and, and you don't let your camera fall out, as you look around, I wish you could see this, but you're looking around. You look down, you look up. There's the hat. Where'd it go? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And it, the accelerometer in the phone, it works. How big is that? Because Android phones vary so much in size. Yeah, this is How a five inch. So this is the HTC One. It's five inches, but it would fit a variety. As you can see, it's, you know, I don't think it would make the six inch. It Any scales. It scales because it's got little lenses. And you know what? How is it not as good as uh, as Oculus Rift? Mm -hmm. I just like don't think that the, the optical quality is quite as good as an Oculus, uh, given that it's dealing with multiple size phones, and, and I think the lenses are a little bit cheaper. But yeah, I mean, it's nine tenths of the way there for, like you said, a, a small <laughs> fraction of the cost. It's the kind of thing that you can ship somebody in the mail for, you know, a buck twenty-five, uh, and they can get a feel for what VR is like, yeah. and whether or not they should get excited about and it. And who doesn't have a, an Android phone? You could do this. And, and somebody said, "Well, your arms get tired. Well, it'd be easy enough to just to glue a little rubber band, you know, a strap. Actually, I have a rubber Duct tape. Band. It'll work too. Just put this on. <laughs> Where did you get that? <laughs> And then, you're going to oh. get more grief from wearing that than wearing glass. <laughs> I just thought that's, that's the best. That's, see, Google's had problems because they give away such great stuff. You know, they gave away thousands of dollars worth of stuff last year that, they, that nobody can get in anymore. They had to have a lottery to get in. I think half the people going there aren't developers. They just want free crap. So give away cardboard, and maybe it'll be easier to get into the developers conference. And frankly, this is giving me a lot of joy, as you can see. Yeah, they either wanted that. free stuff or they wanted to protest one or the other, but right. those were the two hot tickets, yeah. either cardboard or protesting. Yeah, we noted that uh, Google at the beginning of the of the uh, I.O. keynote noted that 20% uh, of the uh, attendees of Google I.O. this year were female, but I want to point out that 50% of the protesters were female, so there's still some catching up to do. <laughs> oh, here's my Oculus Rift. Now, we we got tweeted... Um, from, let's see, who is this? G. Rajib yeah. on Twitter that the Dodo case people yeah. are making their own model awesome. and they're calling it the Google Cardboard VR Toolkit for 1995. Perfect. Not bad. Cheaper than eBay. And there's no wires. It's wireless. Um, they have a museum tour. They have a tour of Versailles. I mean, I think, I don't know. I think this does everything the Oculus Rift does. <laughs> anyway, that's enough of that. We'll talk about uh, what Google announced at Google I.O. because it's a kind of a mishmash, and I want to get everybody uh, to involved in that. But before we do, we should talk about the uh, Supreme Court because uh, 
Those those the SCOTUS was a little bit busy on Friday with two, I think, land well important rulings. One may be a landmark ruling. But let's start with the less important ruling, and that's the one that's got all the geeks ahead up, and that's the area ruling. Now, uh, Denise uh, had a great This Week in Law uh, on Friday discussing the area ruling, and I, I certainly point you to that show if you want to really go into detail. But let's, it's called Monkeys, Ducks, and Unicorns. Uh, and one of your guests was, uh, Sonia West was uh, from the University of Georgia, right? Was, uh, right, yeah, their was, school of law. She was an expert on this whole issue. But maybe, Denise, you can kind of summarize, what did the Supreme Court rule? Well, the Supreme Court tried to do something very limited uh, and say that somebody who is doing what Aereo does in the way Aereo does it is directly infringing copyright law by engaging in a public performance uh, of the copyrighted works here, the free over-the-air broadcast television that Aereo was providing to its customers via its series of tiny dime size antennas. ABC had sued uh, saying that Aereo is illegally retransmitting ABC television programming via the local television stations. Right, ABC and other networks. And uh, it's been a very long and arduous uh, and multi-jurisdictional uh, world of litigation around this issue because They've Aereo is not the only company right. uh, that has tried going after this using this kind of technology. So we've had some conflicting decisions from around the country uh, at the federal court level. Um, and what the Supreme Court was specifically looking at was an injunction against Aereo uh, that was declined to be put in place by the New York Federal Court of Appeal. The, so the, the New lower York court, court said Aereo was okay. Said Aereo was okay for now, doesn't need to be enjoined. We're still going right. to have a trial on right. all these copyright issues. But uh, what you haven't done, broadcasters, is show a strong likelihood that you're going to be able to demonstrate at trial that Aereo directly infringed copyright. And that's a big distinction, whether Aereo directly infringed or whether its users are somehow engaged in copyright infringement. Because when you think back on the history of the kinds of copyright cases the Supreme Court has considered, you think about the Grokster case, you think about... Uh, the Betamax case uh, way back then, uh, we're, we're talking about things that could be copyright infringement by the users, but the person supplying the intermediary technology uh, may or may not be responsible for what the users are doing. And uh, here the direct question before the court was, is there, is Aereo itself performing? We know there's a performance going on, uh, of the copyrighted works that the broadcasters are putting out there. Uh, but is Aereo doing that performance or is the performance happening on the viewer side? And that turns out to be a very important distinction uh, under copyright So law. the fact that Aereo won this decision, all that means, does that mean now that the injunction, that the injunction will be in effect? It means that Aereo has to go back to the lower court. It means that Aereo has to go back to the lower the court, The trial yes. is, is still on. There still will be a trial, right? Right. And under this decision from the Supreme Court, there should be an injunction against Aereo's, the live broadcast, the near live broadcast right. aspect of Aereo's and, business. And so Aereo has just kind of unilaterally decided to suspend business. Which is sad because uh, if they don't go ahead and, and litigate out the issues in this case... Uh, we're not really going to reach the complicated uh, nuances here that I, that I think, you know, still need to be explored. The Supreme Court looked way back to the late 60s and 70s before the 1976 Copyright Act and said, basically, the majority opinion uh, authored by Justice Breyer said, you know, our hands are kind of tied because we had some opinions that we, the Supreme Court, are predecessors on the Supreme Court authored way back in the late 60s and the 1970s that looked at the community access 
television system, the old cable system, uh, where people would put antennas on hills because people did not have good reception at their homes and not powerful enough, amplified enough reception to really make use of free over the air broadcast television. And we, we had decided in a couple of those decisions that there wasn't a public performance going on. There wasn't a performance going on at all. And you know what Congress did? They came in in 1976 and undid those decisions. That they gave the copyright made. owner exclusive right to perform the copyrighted work publicly. Right. And they decided that cable companies were actually doing that and that... If that's the case, and then, you know, we, you were talking before the show about now all the regulations and requirements that are incumbent on cable companies because of the role that they are playing in passing along the signal, the free broadcast over the air television signal to their customers. Um, so the court went through some really strange machinations of, you know, just couldn't really, I think, get its head around uh, Aereo's technology very well or the fact that Aereo's technology should be treated different than an antenna on okay, a hill so that's, that lots that's, of people are sharing. That's point one. And I, I mentioned before we began that I think my position on this is contrarian to what most geeks feel like. And I think geeks love the Aereo. They love the idea of screwing the cable companies, screwing the networks. Well, nobody loves either. And uh, why shouldn't we be able to pay eight bucks and be able to watch TV over the air using these antennas? But it strikes me as Aereo is doing exactly what the original cable system was supposed to do. The cable, which is why we heard so many of the dissent and, and most of the judges actually who ruled for this, like Justice Sotomayor was saying, like she kept scratching her head, saying, "Why is this not a cable company? How is Let's this just not call different? Them a cable company, yeah. right? When if you really look into the technology, clearly it's not a cable company. I disagree. Uh, I think it's exactly the same thing as community access television. I think it's exactly the same thing. It, it, it original ca Now, understand cable don't do it this way anymore. But in the original days, as, as Denise was saying, they put up an antenna because you couldn't get it. And they ran a cable to your house. And everybody who subscribed to that cable company used that antenna. Is right. it? But everybody didn't have their own antenna. Well, first of all, right. and you're time first of all, I know this antenna, wasn't our. So you have the same right to it in the way that you don't with a cable company. It's 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 a lot like a timeshare, like those timeshare solar gardens that are popular okay. these days. Like first, you're paying into first, the hardware. What? How does this change your argument? If the dime size antennas are lies, does this change your argument? No, no. It, okay, because I want to point out that antenna experts have said, and I'll point you to this article from Pete Putman hdtvexpert.com, that in fact, it's not possible that these dime size antennas could inf effectively receive the transmissions. They're too small. They're probably acting as an array, despite what Aereo says. Now, I admit this was not argued in court. In fact, what the court yeah. decided is we're not even going to think about the technology. Let's just see the end result. And I think the court probably was right because you could debate this issue, the dime size antenna issue, Till the cows come home. But they stipulated the Aereo was telling the truth. I don't think Aereo is telling the truth. How, the Aereo is doing two things to get around the Copyright Act. One is the dime size antennas. Two is a six second delay. But in fact, isn't it doing exactly the same thing as a cable company does, really? From the point of view of the user, from the point of view of everybody else. I, well, I, certainly the majority of the Supreme Court felt that way. The, the I think they got it right. The very well-reasoned Scalia dissent uh, points out why we shouldn't consider it that way. Uh, and uh, Justice Scalia joined by Justices Thomas and Alito. The uh, most conservative members of the court. Right, exactly. And I think they were giving a constructionist argument. They, I don't think that they were arguing in favor of the technology, but they just were uncomfortable with the court overreaching. And I think uh, they were worried it, about the precedent in cloud right. computing in mm -hmm. general, because in this way we can call iTunes Match, a cable company. If you and I just play the same album at the same time, we're we're forgetting about the. But we the pay user for it, and iTunes pays for it. It's yes. There is, and so I think Aereo gets around this and and knew it from the beginning by paying retransmission fees like a cable company, and then it's all legal. 
Here's, here's what Justice Scalia would say to you, Leo. He says, I share the court's evident feeling that what Aereo is doing or enabling to be done to the network's copyrighted programming ought not to be allowed, but perhaps we need not distort the Copyright Act to forbid it. As discussed at the outset, Aereo's secondary liability for, for, for performance infringement is yet to be determined. They've never even gotten to that issue in the case as is its primary and secondary liability for reproduction infringement. If that does not suffice, then assuming one shares the majority's estimation of right and wrong, what we have before us must be considered a loophole in the law. It is not the role of this court to identify and plug loopholes. It is the role of good lawyers to identify and exploit them and the role of Congress to eliminate them if it wishes. Well, it Congress can do that, I may add, in a much more targeted, better informed, and less disruptive fashion right. than the crude looks like table TV solution the court invents today. Well, it sounds like Justices Scalia, Thomas, and Alito merely said we shouldn't have taken this case in the first place, right? That's what they're saying. Mm, or having no. taken it, we shouldn't make a ruling? I think having taken it, we should we should find that there's no performance going on here is is what they would say under the technology that they're reviewing that justice the three dissenting justices rejected this whole notion that we can't look under the covers or behind the scenes and and that that would be unimportant. What's only important is the the impact because in other cases we definitely the user look experience. under the covers. Yeah, we right. definitely look at what the technology is doing in the cable vision case that. Uh, blessed the notion of a remote DVR, it, the, how the technology works was very important and whether the users were directing the performance. To what selecting if the, I the put items. myself in the, in, uh, in the position of the content creators, the networks. What if somebody were to take Twit and rebroadcast it in some form, charge people eight bucks to do it, um, Add to my audience, great, but in a way that I can't count and monetize it. I would be pissed off. And I think I would have a, I would have a right to recourse. Doesn't, Doesn't that don't happen? These there are plenty of podcast apps that maybe rebroadcast or use. They do, and our rule with those, like Stitcher is a good example, is they have to, mm -hmm. they cannot keep a copy of it on their servers. They must merely provide an interface to our copy, which we count. So they don't cache our content they come they just provide an interface to get it which is fine with me because i can count it but if some but i've always had the rule that if somebody comes along and says and by the way there's that guy in la who has that what is that bizarre business where he's rebroadcasting <laughs> stuff completely illegally over the internet uh he rebroadcasts us it's my position that uh, because i can't count that rebroadcast it's he's not his right to do that Right. And is I think, it not? I think, we're, I think we're talking apples and oranges is, the, is okay. the problem. We're not talking about free over the air broadcast TV brought down by an antenna and whether it matters who has the antenna. We're, we're talking about something completely different, um, a, a piece of video that you put out under a certain license and certain um, uses are allowed under that license. You also make it um, embeddable uh, via YouTube. So, you know, being able to embed uh, around the internet is is fine if you're um, doing so because it I don't do twit the over terms. the air for free it's not related it's not it's different I think it's different yes yeah. I, I think that um, one of the things that the the fact that film on about, TV and this guy I don't know why this guy's still in business rebroadcast twit and by the way everything else it looks like in the world so did, he copies and rebroadcasts or does he yeah. embed? Copies and rebroadcasts. Yeah, so that's, I think, pretty clearly if, if you know, I'm not here to give the network legal advice, but I think if you consulted with a lawyer, you might find that uh, there that could well be actionable. So the difference on is because he copies and rebroadcasts it. Because, and Ario has always said this. Well, we don't, we just give, we're all, our business is to rent an antenna. Right. Our business is to rent an antenna. And, but isn't and that what the cable the company's business was? It was, but it was it was oh, one antenna on a hill, <laughs> you I know, see. The fool on the hill, um, being shared by many, and uh, we're not talking about that situation here. We're talking about much more. Um, I think the cable vision 
uh, situation where was the particular user directing the particular recording on the remote DVR, that decision uh, was never taken up by the Supreme Court. Uh, they had the chance to, to decide that that was wrongly decided in one way, and they didn't do that. So it's still the law until the Supreme Court decides otherwise. And I think they've, they've kind, you know, the majority decision doesn't even really address that they may have monkeyed around with that. And in fact, went out of its way to say, we're not touching the DVR aspect of Aereo's business. That's not in front of us right now, but, but I think you can't really get around the fact that um, their decision impacts not just uh, remote DVR services, but potentially things. Uh, Professor Eric Goldman has a great article on four an unanswered questions that the Aereo case leaves. And one of those unanswered questions is, well, if we're not going to look at how things work technologically and whether technologically they comply with what we've decided is okay under the law or not, then things like embedding could well be jeopardized. You know, it's hard to tell if that uh, right. film on is embedding or copying, you have to go behind the scenes and under the hood to figure that out. And, you know, should it matter? Well, the law has always says, said that it does. So it, it's, it's a dangerous precedent in that way. I hate to get in bed with Scalia, Alito. <laughs> <laughs> Embrace the Sicilian Leo. <laughs> and Thomas <laughs> and say uh, that basically Aereo is like a, copy store with library cards yeah that's not the that greatest analogy <laughs> doesn't really i feel like if this is this is these are the guys we're gonna say oh they got it right huh tim you haven't said a word what do you think well it's because i think denise has got a pretty good lock on the situation uh you know my non-legal gut instinct is that uh, i tend to agree with the dissenting opinion here i mean I think it is a loophole that's being exploited by Aereo, but I think that it, it is ultimately a loophole. And, you know, I don't know where you draw the line. If there's one antenna for me that somebody else is leasing to me and that's legal, uh, you know, if there's two antennas that somebody else is leasing to two people and that's legal, um, you know, at what point does it become illegal? And, of course, as you mentioned, if indeed this is all a bit of a lie and all those antennas are acting in series, then that's a different story altogether. Does that change uh, but, things? You know, uh, in my eye, it absolutely does, yes. Uh, at that point, then there's no there's no doubt that they are breaking the law. But, you know, taking things at face value uh, and, uh, you know, assuming that they're not uh, lying to us, uh, then, yeah, I don't see why this would not be the same as just having a bunch of separate antennas and leasing those individually. So I am a little bit disappointed by the ruling, but ultimately I'm, I'm not surprised at all by the ruling. That's This is pretty much how I expected it to go down. So just we're going to wrap it up, but just to get clear in my mind, Denise. Yeah. Uh, if it's kind of like a hypothetical, if what they were doing is – passing it on like they the 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 consumers choosing the channel the consumers choosing what to watch area is doing nothing but letting them do that and pass it on that would not be a public performance that would be legal uh no i don't think that's quite what the court in the majority decision said um what, what they said should is there's what did the court did the court give any direction area about how they could make this legal uh, no, <laughs> did, did not really. Just looked at what it was doing and said, so you can't do uh, that. We think you're like a cable company and what you're doing is skirting the law. You know, we had some cases on the books in the late 60s and the 70s that embraced what you were doing, you know, in right. the form of what the cable companies were doing then. The cable And we case. think yeah. that Congress in 1976 expressly enacted, they, it goes so far as to say, we think that Congress enacted the 1976 Copyright Act specifically to undo these two decisions that we that the Supreme Court uh, had right. deciding that cable companies were not public publicly performing. And it just decided so much that uh, what Aereo was doing looked like what they were doing that that there it ought to be treated the same way. And I think although this does not come through, it is not expressly stated in the opinion, I think there must have been some sort of underlying concern that if we go ahead and say that this is not a public performance, then the cable companies, all they have to do to get out from under all the must carry and retransmission fees and licensing consent requirements that they are under now, the very heavily regulated industry that they are, all they have to do is adopt an Aereo-like technology and they're golden. They're, they're no longer cable companies either. 
And and I think the court was concerned about that kind of thing. Again, this is just my guess on, on that front. In the oral um, arguments, they were very concerned that whatever decision they made would impact services like Dropbox. Do you think that the decision they've made, I think you brought this up too, Natalie, the decision that they made now does um, uh, put Dropbox in a tenuous position? Or no, it protects Dropbox. You're asking me or Natalie? Well, I'll ask you, Denise, then I'll ask Natalie. All right. Um, You're the lawyer don't ask here. We me. Put I think you that's on. the question. I don't have the answer. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think the court is trying hard not to jeopardize services like Dropbox or Google Drive and to say, hey, if you're not dealing in free over the air broadcast television, uh, we don't apply, this decision won't apply. But um, I'm not quite sure. And when you read through the dissent, there are good arguments why it's difficult to draw lines. You know, right. it, it's, it's going to be fuzzy. Well, as I, to what's a public performance. And uh, as Justice Scalia says, it looks like uh, this standard will sow confusion for years to come. And <laughs> I, I think that we will see some confusion around what constitutes a public performance after this decision. But it is what the Supreme Court's job is to try to uh, infer what the intent of the, of the legislation was and to enforce it in a way that's consistent with the legislation, right? I mean, they're, they're not overstepping their bounds. That's what they do. But they right. also know what they do is set precedences, right. which is why I think Scalia was so uncomfortable saying we're trying to ensure that this won't set a precedence, but we cannot assure that. Right. Right. And if Congress intends for things that aren't cable companies to be treated like cable companies, they maybe should say Congress that. should say that. They should say that, not the, yeah. not the court. But this right. happens all the time. The court's always making decisions about what it thinks Congress meant. That's a lot of what the court does, right? Yes. Fox exactly. is already it's using Aereo's defeat as ammunition against Dish, right. by the way. They're revisiting a, a, a case they already lost, saying, but wait a minute. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't have lost this, and they're going back to the court. Mm -hmm. So this is just the beginning. Uh, Fox's lawyer, Richard Stone, wrote a letter to the court saying, Dish, which engages in virtually identical conduct when it streams Fox's program to Dish subscribers over the Internet, has repeatedly raised the same defenses as Aereo. Those defenses have now been rejected by the Supreme Court. They're trying to have the case reheard. Um, I yeah okay. A couple of things to point out. Yes, of course, Area was trying to take advantages of uh, loopholes. You could call them loopholes, or just the way the law was written. They worked very hard when they first created the business to, you know, create a business that was legal, that was based on the law, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, Somebody, some have said, well, that's wrong. You know, their intent was to circumvent, but, you know, they try to use loopholes to get away with it. But, hey, that's what happens. Every com company does when they try to avoid paying taxes, too. You just, you find the loopholes and you use them. That's not illegal. And uh, and their intent, if they, the, the Supreme Court's not ruling on the intent of whether they intended to uh, violate copyright, right? Or are they? Well, there is this volitional aspect to copyright infringement, and it comes into play in the, in the cable vision case and whether the user is doing the selecting or the intermediary technology entity. Um, so it, it comes into play there. And, and if you're just uh, passing through and allowing the user to do the selection, you know, I mean, Corey, whether it really makes sense to be able to go after all of Aereo's users for copyright infringement. But that's, you know, what we've seen in the movie industry, in the music industry, in other similar situations. So, so yeah, you might uh, find yourself in that kind of weird world. But um, the other thing that could have put Aereo on the hook, getting back to direct liability or... Uh, indirect liability is if it's inducing in, uh, users to infringe, and that's what did away with Grokster. Right. So Grokster didn't infringe, but because right. they gave users the ability to infringe and incented them to do so, it was deemed illegal. Right. So the direct infringement thing is is what's right. uh, really problematic here. The other thing I think that comes up is that a lot of people are upset with the decision not on the law or the merits of the law and whether the Supreme Court's right or wrong, but just because they wanted Aereo to succeed. I think that's the vast majority of geeks. We just wanted this way to do this. Right. 
Doc Searles put up a good post today, um, just sort of lamenting the fact that Aereo did not position themselves differently in this case and did not um, come across not as the, you know, person providing you with a dime size or the company providing you with a dime size antenna, but instead the company providing you with the ability to actually receive free over the air broadcast because as Doc writes in his post, that's virtually impossible to do in a lot of places. And Doc, you know, by the way, agrees with me. Yeah. He says the court was right that Aereo should have cleared performance rights with the stations and didn't. Um, but I think mm -hmm. he makes the right case, which is that Aereo made the wrong case. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that Aereo might, might have wanted to do a little different kind of approach to what their business was. Yeah. Uh, he says Aereo is a perfect example of the marketplace at work after the digital TV trans transition, Aereo fulfilled a demand that existed because people couldn't could no longer get over the air signals. Right. They if Aereo met a market demand, and that's that's how these things work. I just I don't know that it would have done a lot of good because that's what the original right. cable companies do did too, and right. we're you know Didn't whether you should even consider right. Aereo a cable company is is really the crux of this case. I also think that, in, and sometimes we, in our zeal to get new technologies and to and to cut the cable uh, uh, and all of this, we forget that people who create content do deserve to get paid for it, do have rights to be protected, that there's a reason why there are patents and copyrights. These are not uniformly bad things. In fact, they're very good things, and they do support innovation. If, you know, innovation comes when you have a feeling that you can make, them, make some money on it, that there's a reason for you to innovate, not just because of hey, it's a good thing, I like to do this, but because it's a business. Well, I can't yes, help but wonder but, if, if Aereo yeah. had partnered up with, with Nielsen to be able to provide ratings and, and viewership numbers back to the broadcasters and effectively so that those eyes were counted. Uh, that might right. have changed things a little bit because ultimately, you know, for over-the-air broadcasts, that's the only way that these companies really have an idea of what people are watching. With cable, they can get views, obviously, and through streaming networks, they can, of course, know what's going on. But beyond that, it's pretty much reliant on Nielsen numbers. And, uh, and, and I wonder if they had done something there so that those numbers got back so that advertisers at least would know what's going on. That might have helped their case a little bit. I think, I think frankly, um, if Aereo had gone to the locals and said, we want, re we want to retransmit, do you give us permission? This is what a cable company does. Do you give us permission? And the, and the locals say, yeah, but you got to pay me a 10 cents a subscriber and agreed to that. Admittedly, they wouldn't have had an $8 a month service, but they would also be legal. And I feel like that Aereo really set us up. Said, no, you can have an $8 a month service. You just We just do these things and magically it's legal. And they've been proven wrong. So for people to get upset... Well, now you're getting into economics, though, because what is the cost is definitely not what we pay our cable companies. That is not the cost. We pay for a lot of things we do not consume. And so the cost is, if I'm talking on behalf of the user, inflated. Um, but you're right. It's not $8 a month, and it's not 60 Like, the real cost <laughs> somewhere in between what we consume there, I is somewhere in between. <laughs> well, then, in fact, that was an opportunity for Aereo then. Yeah, I think so, too. Price it right. Pay the transmission retransmission fees. But still, if still be less than cable, and maybe you know, I don't know. I just, I I do feel that like, Aereo, There was a wink, wink, nudge, nudge in Aereo's business model, right? I know. Yeah, I, kind of, middle I kind of feel there. like Justice Breyer what, talking about we're not going to look at what happened behind the scenes is kind of like saying we're not going to look at right. They're trying to end run. No, no, and he was right not to. That's probably right. The court should probably legal. not do that because that's hard to determine somebody's intent. No, I meant technologically behind the scenes. Right. Oh, he, and I think that was also right because yeah, that they would have gotten in the weeds. They don't have all day to do this. They got a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah, so they're, they're like, trying in these to go on vacation, I think you need right? To look. Right, they want to go on vacation. They only have October <laughs> to July. They got stuff to do. They got some fishing. They're working up against a break. That's why we got two big rulings. <laughs> like, Fourth all of right, July we're not agreed, Friday. but all we right. got to get out of here. So, I, I frankly don't think the Aereo case matters all that much because it seems to me in five years, sooner or later, everything will be on the internet. That's where it's going. This is these last gasp 
lawsuits are merely an attempt to kind of keep the business model going a little bit longer. But just as with everything else, it's all going to be on the Internet. None of this is going to matter in the long run. Um, this is a short-term problem. Area was solving a short-term issue. Um, and am I wrong on this? I mean, I understand that cable companies and television companies are going kicking and screaming. But at some point, sooner than later, it's going to all be on the Internet. Yeah, it's just a question of what it's going to cost. Right. And uh, Well, that's why know. Comcast is doing what it's doing to, <laughs> to, to become the evil empire because <laughs> they want to make sure that if they can't charge you for HBO and Showtime and a package of stuff just so you can watch the World Cup, at least they can charge <laughs> you the, through the wazoo for your Internet access. And, and notice, by the way, if you look at the pricing, the pricing of cable with Internet and cable without Internet, cable TV with Internet, cable without Internet, has come closer and closer and closer. The differential is very small, and it's getting smaller all the time because they know eventually they're not going to be able to charge you for television, but they're going to get it out of you for cable, for Internet, rather. Yeah. Are we all in agreement that, Tim, do you agree that, it, how, what do you, what's the time frame, you think, before all content is on the Internet, period? Yeah, I would say five years might even be a bit pessimistic, but yes, certainly in the very near future, at least, you know, here in the United States anyway, uh, I think that within probably two or three years, we'll see all but very fringe content, uh, you know, like RFD TV, which has cattle auctions and things like that. That will <laughs> take a little bit longer to get over. Cattle auctions um, yeah. are the first thing that should go on the Internet. I actually used to enjoy that channel when I when I got it. It brought me <laughs> you back. You should come my, to Petaluma. We got an auction house right Vermont. up here. Yeah, it's great. The I know. I walked by there. <laughs> I assume you're meeting legally on the internet. Say again? Yeah, legally on the yeah, that's that's legally true. Yeah. in an authorized and oh, uh, yeah, paid of course. For fashion. Everything on the can be gotten on the internet right now, but what? But legitimately, legally, with the sanction of the content creators. Yes. Yeah, I'd say three, four years in the outset. Yeah. Yeah. And when the but content the creators then break the model so that you can subscribe to one channel without all of the rest of them, because that's what really pisses us off so much about the cable companies is not so much their service or lack thereof, but paying for things that we don't consume and wanting to, you know, buy a, a cable package that doesn't include whatever that channel you just were talking about, horse, whatever. <laughs> horse auctions. No, I, I think TV. truthfully, the real... The real people behind this, and the ones who are most concerned about area, were the cable companies. Because what they, you know, it's not, yes, it was the content creators suing, but I think the cable companies do not want this to change. They're, they need to per, per, uh, preserve their power as long as possible. Otherwise, HBO and ESPN and everybody else just go directly to the consumers and say, pay us 10 bucks a month for HBO Go, disintermediate Comcast. Who needs them? Right. And yeah. the only reason they don't do that is they're terrified of Comcast. Right. They can't then, afford yet to do that. Then mm. you get into the legal issues around those aggregating the, you know, wild and woolly world of disaggregated everything on the Internet. Well, if that's it's the way it should be. not being bundled for you and someone tries to bundle it, that was Google TV's issue, right? That, right. that you were going to be able to select your yeah. CBS and they didn't like NBC that. online. Yeah. Uh, no, they didn't like that at all. Mm -hmm. I should be able to buy, forget channels... I should be able to buy Game of Thrones. I shouldn't have to right. buy HBO. I shouldn't have to buy a package from Comcast. Mm -hmm. I should be able to buy Game of Thrones. And you know what? When that happens, it won't be HBO that's producing it. It'll you can, be, though. You can buy it by episode you can wait a year later. Right. Yeah. right. <laughs> but the, what's happening, and I think the music the industry realizes this, is that who you're competing against is BitTorrent. The real competitor is BitTorrent because mm -hmm. they're offering it for free in high quality the minute the show ends. Illegal, obviously, right? Uh, all right, we're going to take a break because there was a, I think, much more important Supreme Court decision regarding cell phone searches. And uh, again, we'll go to our legal beagle, <laughs> Denise Howell, <laughs> who's going to give us the information uh, in just a moment. Gra really glad to have you, Denise, from uh, This Week in Law, a must-watch every Friday afternoon on uh, Twit from um, NBC, the wonderful Natalie Morris. So far, no children eruptions, no puppy eruptions. Oh, but gosh. You just doomed us. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have bird eruptions from Tim Stevens. He's up in Upper New York State. He, of course, works for CNET. Got it right this time. Our show today brought to you by lynda.com, the best place to go and learn what you want at your convenience. Linda has over 2,400 very high-quality courses 
in every aspect of technology, whether you're a developer, a designer, a photographer, even, they even have business classes, things like how to negotiate a contract, how to write a resume. You can learn it all. Watch, listen, practice, learn with Lynda, L-Y-N-D-A dot com. They just released a new iPhone and iPad app for iOS 7 that's just gorgeous. They've also enhanced their Android app by adding Chromecast support. So now you can watch Linda everywhere, including your big screen TV via your Chromecast. It's, the iOS app has a beautiful visual intuitive interface. Both new apps offer online course and video viewing. By the way, with the courses, you get more than just the video. You also get the transcripts. You can jump right to a particular part of the course if there's some particular thing you want to learn. And you might say, well, I don't want to pay for a whole course if I'm only going to you know, look at one part. Well, the good news is it's a flat rate. You pay a monthly fee, $25 a month, and you get access to everything. So you can learn just the stuff you want to know. Linda's instructors are the best in the world, the people we work with in many cases. Great photographers, designers, Burt Monroy, love him, does a great Photoshop show every week at lynda.com. Courses for every level, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. Whether you have 15 minutes or 15 hours, you can learn at lynda.com. Many companies have Linda, including ours, have Linda accounts. We're, you know, we're moving to Premiere. We send our editors over there if they want to polish their Premiere skills. It's $37.50 a month for the premium plan. That, then you get the exercise files that let you follow along with the instructors. That's great for Photoshop or Final Cut. You can also try it right now with our free trial. Seven days, unlimited access to Linda, L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash twit2. Linda.com slash twit2. You'll get all of the courses at last count. Let me see how many courses they've got online. It's some huge number. You can get every one of those courses, 2,701 of them. Many tens of thousands of hours, absolutely free for seven days. How much can you learn in seven days? At lynda.com slash twit and the number two, lynda.com. Thank them for their support. I've known Linda Wyman since the screensavers days, and they've just done such a good job. So uh, at the same exact time as they released the Aereo decision, they released the cell phone decision. And I think this is uh, very good news for privacy in this country. Even if you have been arrested, the police still must seek, in most cases, a warrant before they can search your cell phone. And we know law enforcement actually has boxes they can plug into your phone and dump all the data off of it. And they do often routinely do that. But the Supreme Court ruled Wednesday that this is, you got to get a warrant. Is that, is that good? Denise? Oh, it's fabulous. Yes. Riley versus California is the case. Unanimous decision of the Supreme Court, uh, which, you know, you get a lot of court watchers saying what that means and if it's really and truly unanimous or if, as you suggest, Leo, they're, they're just... Wheeling and dealing behind the scenes. On, I'll trade you an Aereo for a uh, cell phone. Right. Yeah. Right. But, uh, yes, um, here we have the court actually... Uh, really showing a, a good grasp of what new technologies mean and how they impact people's lives and uh, the difference between being able to search someone's pocket for a weapon or something else that might hurt uh, an officer during an arrest or something else that might be informationally important to the arrest, um, evidence that you could gather just by uh, you know, it's all on joint. my phone. Exactly. No, you're gonna you're gonna find lots of evidence on somebody's phone, but it's gonna be stuff that uh, not only could convict them, that is gonna be a lot of other stuff too. So the so, so the case was a guy who was stopped for a traffic violation. Mm -hmm. They uh, I guess must have given the probable cause, seen weapons. They he was seized, he was arrested on weapons charges. The officer searching him seized a phone from his pants pocket. The officer accessed information on the phone, noticed the repeated use of a term associated with a street gang. At the police station two hours later, a detective specializing in gangs further examined the phone's contents. Based on photographs and videos, the detective found the state charged the petitioner in connection with a shooting that had occurred a few weeks earlier and sought an enhanced sentence based on gang membership. Um, he was, he was uh, convicted, then appealed... California Court of Appeals affirmed, but the and Supreme the California Supreme Court and the California Supreme Court, but the, not mm -hmm. the United States Supreme Court unanimously. They said 
that was unlawful search and seizure. So what do we need to do now as uh, uh, citizens if we are stopped by the police and they say, can I have your phone? Should we just say no? Uh, yeah, you could you you smash say, it well, right in front of them. I'll say, you know, in Riley versus the state of California. <laughs> Smashing it, not you such a good it. idea. You eat it. You eat the phone. You could have obstruction charges against you under those kinds of circumstances. Don't do that either. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, without a warrant, they can't search your Actually, phone. Actually, so if you've done something wrong, give them the phone. <laughs> Let them <laughs> say, oh, officer, no, you're not allowed to search that, but here. And then they throw the whole thing out of court. <laughs> Chief Justice Roberts wrote, modern cell phones, I love this, are not just another technological convenience. With all they contain and all they may reveal, they hold for many Americans the privacies of life. The fact that technology now allows an individual to carry this in his hand does not make the information any less worthy of protection. I love that. That's right on. I also like how he said that the term cell phone itself is pretty much outdated and yeah. that these are effectively cameras or journals right. or, you know, any sort of thing that should and is normally protected by law. And I thought that was a great point that he made as well. So yeah. this is according to the Daily Dot, this review reverses a five decades old interpretation of the law that allowed arresting officers to search suspects, pockets, phones and anything else within his or her reach. So it's it, this is this is kind of new law. Yes, so definitely. wait, they are allowed it's to. It's just not they the were. same as a pocket. Book. Yeah, they, and they can. They can still, you know, the seat of your car, your pocket. Uh, they can pat you down. You know, if if the safety concern of the officers has all always been behind, um, you can go ahead and do a search incident to arrest. But if you're going to search a cell phone, this decision says, you're going to need to get a warrant. And, and law enforcement was... Uh, not wild about this decision and and fought it because they said, well, particularly in today's day and age, getting a warrant's not going to be effective because uh, what if someone just, you know, you've got Apple, they've got this great remote wipe, Android does it too. Uh, we're going to have our evidence destroyed. And, and the court, you know, really showed a nice grasp, not only of the nature of the cell phone, but of, of how these things work in the decision. Um, it talks about uh, as to remote wiping, uh, there are means to address that. First of all, you could turn the phone off. Then it can't be wiped. <laughs> Bear right. that in mind, law right. enforcement officers. And also you could use a Faraday bag. Would you ever have expected to I see have one the of word those. Faraday <laughs> bag in a U.S. Supreme Court decision? The fact that they know such a thing exists is awesome. Isn't Obviously, it was some smart clerk, right, who wrote this decision. Such devices are commonly called Faraday bags wow. after the English scientist Michael Faraday. Ooh, they are essentially lesson. sandwich bags made of aluminum foil, cheap, lightweight, and easy to use. And they show you, then, then they cite the wow. brief of the criminal law professors that was uh, filed as an amicus brief. So they're reading their briefs and they know what this stuff is. Or, or a clerk I, is, yes. Yes. They, they, this may not be a complete answer to the problem, but at least for now, they provide a reasonable response and they they talk about um that not only that law enforcement agencies uh know what faraday bags are and use them and encourage officers to use them but they talk about the fact that a warrant's a lot easier to get than it used to be too yeah. and that unfortunately um, yeah. and that a lot of law law enforcement officers can talk about you know can rely on like a 15 minute electronic right. email response to a request for a warrant so we're not talking about a whole lot of hoops that need to be jumped through here the, the Daily Dot says, in answer to the question, what should you do, lock your phone with a passcode. Uh, if your phone is locked and or encrypted, according to the ACLU, the police may take your phone, may try to look at it unconstitutionally, but they won't be able to. They can't force well, you to put your finger on the identification. <laughs> yeah. If you forgot to lock your phone and don't feel like it, then calmly and respectfully, this will work. Tell the officer his search is in violation of the Constitution under the court's Riley decision. Yeah, I mean, they, that Daily Dot article has some great advice about saying, look, um, if, if you want to search my phone, you need a warrant for that. If they want to go ahead, though, and do it, that same article says, just go ahead and let them do it. You, you know what the law right. is. And but you should out loud state, I do not consent to this search and make right. sure the witnesses hear it. I do not I want to make this clear. I do not consent to this search because then the, whatever they find is uh, inadmissible. 
I got a good question from someone on Twitter along these lines. His name was Mark Jones. And he was sort of keying into the fact that not only, you know, do we keep everything on our cell phones, but we have things like boarding passes. And in his particular case, I guess, his insurance card for, you know, wow. showing that he has uh, auto insurance right. on his cell phone um, and asking if you show that to an officer on your phone, are you giving up your privacy rights to anything else on the phone? I, I certainly don't think so. Um, you know, first of all, you have to be, if you're under arrest is the only way that, that there could even be an issue about an officer's ability to search your phone without a warrant. Um, and just handing an officer an unlocked phone to show a particular item on there, I don't think is communicating consent to search the phone. But again, you might want to say when you're handing the phone over, hey, I don't consent to you searching the whole phone. I also might mention that the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the ACLU have pages called Know Your Rights, where you can print a PDF about what the police can and cannot do, I presume updated thanks to this most recent decision, and uh, also a PDF of tips when confronted by the police. The thing I want to emphasize, this is not designed to, you know, somehow get gang members off because the police do have the ability to ask for a warrant, to put the thing in a Faraday box. There's a lot, you know, it's, it's, you know, if there really is a crime, the police can pursue it. This is to protect uh, our privacy against an overreaching uh, police state. And uh, this is good. Tips for talking to the police. I hope it's... Uh, <laughs> There's a great, long YouTube video by You Should Never, Ever Talk to the Police. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that I, I recommend I, I, I refer you to without recommending it I refer you to if you want to know more I certainly made sure my kids knew it uh, so good news privacy rights are protected what do you think in the, in, the, in the light of these two decisions a lot of people were mocking the Supreme Court in the Aereo case saying oh they're clearly technologically out of touch I actually thought in the oral arguments, uh, most of them, not all of them, but most of them were pretty in touch. Sotomayor showed a real understanding of how this stuff works. I think she knew about Roku boxes and Netflix. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that in this, in this privacy thing, they seem very much in touch with what a cell phone is and, uh, and why it's important to protect. They seem like they are in touch. Yes, Denise? Yeah, I, th I think they're more in touch than people give them credit for. I do think, you know, you're talking about people in an older demographic um, who are still, you know, incorporating these tools in their own life and right. trying to grasp what, how they work and what they mean and um, doing their best with it. And they have really smart clerks, as you pointed out, yeah. Leo. So um, I, I think they, they do a pretty darn good job. Um, you know, the copy shop with the library card, the, <laughs> so you know, much. is something a cable company when it's clearly not, uh, they've, they've got some hurdles to overcome still. And it would be wonderful if we could get someone, you know, truly versed in what technology means and, and how it works and the legal considerations around it on the court. I, I think we're still waiting for that one. It's been, you know, kind of, uh, a truism in technology for years that legislatures, uh, courts, members of Congress don't really understand the modern tech, the modern world. But I think as as the uh, as the older generation ages out and the newer, younger people get elected and appointed, it's getting better. It's getting yeah, it's better. getting better and it's getting different. You know, yeah. I, I keep coming back. I have a ten year old, so. I see the world of Minecraft sort of constantly. <laughs> yeah, that's a very different world. It is, isn't it? it, it and the whole approach to the intellectual property in Minecraft yeah. is is completely, you know, just not something I think the Supreme Court would be able to get their head around. What do you mean people just create worlds and then everybody gets to use them and there's no copyright and there's no right. enforcement? And right. so, yeah, I think we're seeing a generational shift. Absolutely. I do dread the day that everything is an 8-bit Minecraft. <laughs> <laughs> so your kids, like, because Michael just, like, he won't stop playing Minecraft. He loves Minecraft. Your kid's yeah. that way too, huh? Oh, he loves it, yeah. yeah. We, I mean, fortunately, we don't think, we don't need to put him into a 12-step program for it, but he's, <laughs> he's a fan. Good. <laughs> All right, we're we have, have some specific questions for Chad when you have a chance. <laughs> yeah, Chad's the king of Minecraft, obviously, yeah. OMG Craft. We're going to uh, take a break, uh, and we're done with the Supreme Court. Thank you, Supreme Court, for giving us a lot of material today, but there's a lot more to talk about, including Google I.O., 
uh, Apple, Microsoft, and Amazon. Even Twitter's in the news. Um, and I really want to talk about this Facebook study, which apparently I'm the only person upset about. The fact that Facebook tried to manipulate our emotions for one week in, uh, two years ago. But uh, that's going to all have to wait till after this break. Denise Howell is here from This Week in Law. So glad to have you, Natalie Morris from NBC, and Tim Stevens from Upper New York State, and CNET. Are you still on a wireless connection, Tim? Because it looks really good. Uh, no, we uh, paid up to our dues to Time Warner, had them run a cable up the hill, oh, and uh, we are now nice. fully tethered. Nice. Looks good. I can see your freckles. Never, <laughs> never could see those before. I just thought it was an 8-bit problem. All right. <laughs> all right. Um, right now, uh, it's time for snacks. I wish you all were in studio with me because I got my nature box here. We sent some to you, right, Denise? Oh, my gosh, twice. And they each respectively lasted, uh, if they lasted three days in our house, I'd be stunned. Well, that's why we should just get a bigger box for you next time. Yeah. They do come in three <laughs> sizes. Nature Box are healthy, great-tasting snacks delivered right to your door. And at uh, your office, even more important, if you don't want your employees going to the vending machine at 3 in the afternoon and getting all sugared up, you, when they could have delicious treats like uh, praline pumpkin seeds or if you like uh, more savory roasted garlic pumpkin seeds or dried California peaches, the Lone Star Snack Mix. Nature Box has literally hundreds of snacks. If you go to naturebox.com slash twit, you can see a summary of them. All of them nutritionist approved. Never any high fructose corn syrup. Never any trans fats. Nothing artificial. Uh, you can even, if you want to drill down, you can say, I only want vegan or soy-free or gluten-conscious or lactose-free or nut-free. You could choose from savory, sweet, or spicy, but do get an assortment because sometimes you'll look at something and say, I don't know if I really want pear praline crunch. And then you taste it and you say, where have you been all my life, pear praline <laughs> crunch? My God, the world has changed. This because I'm going to Hawaii tomorrow. These are, and I, you know what, I will... Lisa will back me up. The best dried pineapples you have ever had. The mm. Big Island pineapple, dried pineapple rings. I don't know what Nature Box is doing. All the Nature Box bags are resealable, so you don't have to eat the whole bag. In fact, you might want to try not to, because <laughs> as, as Denise says, it's hard to keep this stuff in stock. These yeah. are so good. They're guilt-free. Coconut date energy bites. Mmm. You're making me hungry, Leo. I know. <laughs> me too. My kids go nuts over the uh, sweet potato sticks. They're real sweet potato sticks. Aren't they great? And, and you little, feel good they, as a like mom. Fries. You feel yeah. good giving them to your kids. It's like, yeah, it's all good right. Good stuff. Everybody should have snacks. As, you know, good and I snacks. like the uh, dried garbanzo beans. are like peanuts. They're oh, you like the chechi. You the like the chechi. Yeah. So if all you get from this message is get nature box. <laughs> Just do it. Naturebox.com slash twit. And by the way, we will give you half off your first box, as if that weren't enough. Half off. It is so, I want to bite this pineapple ring right now, but if I do, then we'll have to pause for 10 minutes while I chew it. <laughs> so good. Maybe we can talk them into sending you more than one box a month. Isn't it just a one box a month service at this point? Y That's not enough. You can get as many subscriptions as you want. <laughs> There's no limit. If you want if you want a box a day, you could do it. <laughs> Why not? Naturebox.com slash twit. I know people who would how many we seem to get lots of nature box deliveries. Our staff we feed our staff snacks. We get three a month. We might have to increase it, yeah. We give our snack I mean, I think this is good. I remember it was a big deal at Tech TV when they cut out the oatmeal. That was like the end of the world. We knew that the business was going down because we used to have the cups, you know, of, de of oatmeal and you add hot water. And you, and I think half the staff was living on that oatmeal. Rent's tough in San Francisco. And when do you they, still have the Biscoff spread? Do we? Oh, that should be banned. <laughs> that stuff should be made illegal. That can't be good for you. What it, is it? It's ground it's up Biscoff cookies. They turn Biscoff. I don't know if you ever had Biscoff. There's these, they're like Oreos, but better, right? Yeah, no, they're, they're, I don't know what that they says. They used to give them to you on Google planes. It. I don't know if they still do. They're called so Biscoff good. biscuits. Oh, and then yeah, somebody sure said, hey, you know what? If we grind this like we grind peanuts, you could make a Biscoff butter. Mm -hmm. If you've ever had it, don't if you haven't because <laughs> yeah, you won't be able to stop. You will crave Biscoff butter for the rest of your life. It's terrible. 
And if all those people in the studio should run right now to the fridge and start passing the biscoff around. <laughs> if it's so good. You can European cookie spread. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Just put it in the chat. I think Jeff Needles ate it all. All right. No, mm -hmm. no. He doesn't like. He only eats chicken, unskinned chicken breasts. And what is, is there a vegetable you like? Zucchini. Zucchini. That's right. He actually found a chicken and zucchini cookbook and everything. He eats everything in that cookbook. <laughs> That's it. He's a strange boy. Uh, all right. Needles! All right. Uh, Google I.O. I already showed off the best part of Google I.O., which is the cardboard box. You're right. I found the Dodo case thing, Tim. This is so cool. Dodo case, which makes those great iPad cases, is, is selling a Google Cardboard VR toolkit for 20 bucks. Or add the NFC tag, which isn't that useful for five bucks more. But what it does is when you put your phone in there, the NFC tag goes, hey, and it launches the cardboard app automatically. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see some better made plastic ones here in a couple of weeks. Uh, this could, you know, turn into something of, uh, you know, uh, an app marketplace almost. I mean, I could see devs uh, starting to develop games for this sort of system. And then you're, Why you're not? Isn't that the funniest thing in the world that Google does all this stuff? And like spends billions of dollars to do robots and autonomous vehicles and balloons with the internet. And it turns out a cardboard box is their hottest product. <laughs> that would be fitting, wouldn't it? Uh, well, you know, the IP lawyer in me is just cringing at the fact that someone's <laughs> already duplicated the cardboard box and is using the Google trademark in. Oh my God. Will we see a Supreme Court case? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's maybe maybe it's the Minecraft world and, and Google will decline to enforce. It but. seems like they don't really need to yeah. pursue this one. So uh, you went to Google I.O. Tim Stevens, I know. I did. And uh, I guess the, the thing they handed out at Google I.O. was an Android Wear watch. You had the choice of the Samsung or the LG. Right. And then later you'll get the Moto 360. So which one did you get? Uh, I went with the Samsung, which is here. I was kind of curious to see what Samsung would do in, in the long term uh, with the device. Samsung said during I.O. that they're going to differentiate their device a little bit more. Right now, all three devices do basically the same thing, which is Android Wear notifications plus heart rate and some other stuff. Uh, Samsung did say they'd be bringing some of their functionality to this device. And I did like the look of the Samsung a little bit better. The LG's is more square, more blockish. It looks bigger, even though they're the same size. The, the tapered bezel on the Samsung, I think, looks a little bit nicer. So I went with this guy. But ultimately, in terms of functionality, at least, they're very, very similar uh, devices. Right That's now. actually one thing I found very interesting. I think it was Ars Technica quoting uh, Google's head of engineering that they are going to, unlike with Android phones, that Android Wear, Android Car, and Android TV would all be exactly the same. Android Auto, in particular, you have very little control in Android Auto over the, the look and feel of your apps, and that's by design. Uh, I actually spoke with folks from General Motors and Audi to get a little bit more information on that. But ultimately, you know, when you are talking about something that you use while you're driving, it's very important for that not to be distracting. So Google worked very closely with those auto manufacturers and with others to design a look and feel for the interface that's going to be consistent. It's going to be the kind of thing that you can extend a little bit, but ultimately they're not going to give developers the opportunity to change the look and feel of those apps. So if you go between Spotify and play music, for example, the apps look exactly the same, except the colors change and the logos change. So all the, all the developers can really do there is basically change the orientation of the buttons. They can you know change which buttons are there, but there's always going to be the same row of buttons across the middle and the same basic layout. So that's so that you can kind of get some muscle memory going and, uh, and so that you can't create a, an app that is distracting. Uh, there's been a lot of kind of fear this week about people joking about people creating Video games, you know, running 2048 right. on your dashboard, that kind of thing. But that's that's simply not possible. Well, it also avoids the toxic hell stew, as Microsoft call it. Or was it <laughs> Apple? I can't remember. Somebody called it. Uh, Andrew Cunningham writing in Ars Technica says, it's not just auto. Android Wear and TV will not be skinnable. They will always be the same version. U updates will come from Google directly. Uh, Andrew says he talked with uh, Google Engineering Director David Burke, said all the new Android initiatives announced at the keynote will have user interfaces an underlying software controlled by Google. And that's the deal you make if you're LG or Moto or Samsung. I think that's good on the one hand because uh, you do avoid fragmentation. You do know what you've got. Certainly in an auto application, that's very important. But even for the watches, uh, you, you use one, you'll know how to use the other. This is what Microsoft did with a Windows Phone. But on the other hand, it does kind of limit the innovation in the ecosystem. 
Right. And manufacturers can still create custom apps, of course. They can still de deploy custom content. So Ford, for example, could write an app that only works okay. on Ford cars. Through right. Android Auto, Samsung can write apps that will only run on Samsung watches if they want to. That sort of thing is fine. But yeah, when it comes to the, the core aspect of the operating system itself, that's locked down. And I think just about any Android fan will probably say that's for the best. And of course, when it comes to watches, there's so many more opportunities to personalize the devices much more so than phones now, which all kind of more or less have shaped it or morphed into the same sort of device. It's really difficult to tell phones apart these days. But watches, there's a lot more room for, for differentiation, if, especially when we look at the Moto 360, which is round, versus the other two, which are not round, of course. Uh, that's that's another opportunity for manufacturers to differentiate themselves. And they but even really with the round interface, devices. the cards are going to be the same cards. It's just the corners will be cut off. Right. That's interesting. I uh, immediately, uh, I wasn't at Google I.O., so I didn't get a free one, but I did order... I decided not to get the Samsung because it's Samsung phones only, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I believe so, yeah. yeah I, I think try they said that. Else, though. Yeah, but LG is cross-platform. It'll work with any, uh, four th any Jelly Bean or later, or 4.3 or later maybe. Um, so that's good. That means it'll work with my phone. And they even have a – you can even go to a website on your phone um, and check compatibility, and it'll tell you if it's compatible or not. Um Okay, so look, we've all seen every one of these stupid devices from the Jawbone, the Nike, the uh, to the Pebble. I've had the Gear 1, the Gear 2. All of them have kind of left something to be desired. Is it your experience, as, since you're the only one who has one, Tim, uh, on this panel, that this is any better than those? Uh, it's, it's very different <clears throat> than those. Ultimately, it's, it's <clears throat> doing a, a different sort of thing right now, which is really focused on notifications. I actually think this is closer to Google Glass than, uh, to, to most of the smartwatches that we've seen so far, because really it's focused on notifications first and foremost, and there's not really a lot else that you can do with it. You can do a pedometer on here and you can get your heart rate, which is no better than on any of the other gear devices, which is to say not very good. Um, but there really isn't a lot else that you can do right now. Um, you know, there's but a lot you of can cool talk to it, right? You, it, if if you right. get a if you get a text message, you can respond because it has a microphone. Can right, you can do that if you want to. I haven't really met anybody who wants to be talking to their watch yet, so I'm not sure the <laughs> the value of that to to a lot of people. You look pretty dorky, um, but hey, yeah, we're used to but, that. But you can. I mean, it is nice to be able to say, you know, give me directions to whatever to your watch, and then have it pop up on your phone. That's kind of nice. Uh, and I was also, for example, you know, the contextual stuff is very good. So I was flying back from San Francisco here to Albany uh, on, on Thursday night. And the watch not only gave me the weather in San Francisco where I was, but it gave me the weather here in Albany where I was headed to. And it gave me the weather in Detroit where I was connecting, which I thought was an interesting Because it touch. knows your itinerary. That's awesome. Right. It, it knew all that. And it pops up. Uh, Did it show you your, uh, your QR code for your check-in or does it? Doesn't do that yet. No, uh, at least not for Delta. So I do think that'll be coming in the near future. And I can't wait to confuse the security <laughs> checkpoint people with uh, <laughs> I have it on my uh, watch. a thing on my watch. Yeah, exactly. They already interest, breathe so a deep sigh when you come up with your phone. Yeah, yeah, they absolutely. Don't, they, uh, another one of them. I think that'll be here probably in the near future. And there'll be a lot more apps coming, too. I mean, there's there's obviously space for loading apps to your phone uh, in the app that, that you run on your on your smartphone. Uh, so I think that that will be coming in the near future. But right now, it's it's very much the same sort of interface that you see through Glass, where you get pop-up notifications. It looks like Google Now, really, is what it looks like. Is it, this, is, it, yeah. uh, is it all the same stuff as Now, or...? Uh, as far as I know, yeah, it's all the same cards that you see now. In fact, if you bring up now, you'll see pretty much the same list of, of stuff. It's just on your wrist, of course. And it's it's a little bit more dynamic, of course, because you get those notifications in real time and you kind of feel more inclined to look at them as they pop up. I so like you get a package now. notification. So it's telling me right now on my phone that I have six minutes to go home if I wanted to go home because it knows where I will go after this right. show. It shows me birthdays of people who I follow on Google+. Plus. It shows me the giant score because I know I care about that. The TV show that I watch, it shows it's on tonight, shows me my stocks and articles uh, that I've searched for in the past, I guess, and the local weather. And you know what? It's doing the same thing you just described. It's telling me the weather in Petaluma and in Maui because it knows that's where. I just got where... a notification that uh, Denise Howland has tweeted about me, so that just popped <laughs> up here on the watch too. So you, you get pretty much any notification that shows up on your uh, on your phone will show up here too. So developers don't need to do anything extra to integrate here. So I use AnyDo for uh, for tasking. For Love AnyDo. And those those yeah. pop up. On those the pop watch up too. Uh, now presumably AnyDo can then extend their app and provide more functionality through the watch, right. which I'm looking forward to them doing. Uh, but but for now, those notifications will come right up. I'm excited. I want one. Didn't, uh, Natalie, is this something like? Does this have you? You I know you've used all those other. 
things. Oh, a little bit. I yeah. get tired of them pretty fast. Me you know, too. There was a statistic that came out recently that said that I think it's like 45% of wearables are ditched within six weeks. Yep. Um, hundred percent of mine. For a while, and then you're like, eh, yep. you know, I've and spent I'm still thousands not on these completely things. bought into the like radiation on your body type stuff. So, um, I just don't think we know enough about that kind of thing. So I, I like to play with it a little bit, but, um, also I just don't think they're cute enough. <laughs> I like watches for fashion. My phone does all of that stuff. So. But it's not yeah, that I don't I, think that there's I've a market I've sort of enjoyed it, but... living watch-free for a long time now. Well, you and everybody else, we all, I uh, mean, watches <laughs> right. were superseded by our smartphones. And it is so much trouble to get the smartphone out of your pocket. It's a first-world problem. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely exactly. a solution to a first-world problem, for sure. And, and I do think that we'll yeah. see new new applications and new new reasons to wear these things beyond just notifications. But yeah, right now, it's very much, I can't be bothered to reach in my pocket, or I can't be bothered to dig into the bottom of my purse to pull my phone out. Uh, and that's obviously not Oh, a you have that there. purse problem, too. Yeah, when you I do. So it's it's a large purse, and there's so much that. stuff in there. I can never find anything. Since Boho is back in, those big bags. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Denise? You, would you buy one? Um, I, I don't think so. I'm I kind of like staying on the sidelines for the, yeah. the various watch functionality things to, to see what happens with them and how useful people feel that they are. Um, you know, I'm good with my phone and, uh, already feel, you know, silly enough talking into that. <laughs> that I right. don't know that I necessarily need to talk to my watch. Although, um, I, I think that we do need a world where, the watch and the car and the phone and everything's integrated and whatever technology people like to interact with um, works in a unified way and works well. Uh, so, you know, I, I kind of see what Google is doing, um, exerting a little bit more control over the Android ecosystem here. Uh, the thing I just notified Tim about is our same tweeter that let us know about <laughs> the Google um, uh, what are those things called? Dodo case? Dodo case, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cardboard, so yeah. Um, G. Rajib again uh, sends us uh, the developer's file for the Google Cardboard and um, the schematics and everything. Yeah, so Google, Google published has, it, yeah. Yeah, Google's put all this out. And it's a cool site if you if you, you uh, scroll mm -hmm. your mouse around, it'll actually show you the whole thing. And this, by the way, I think the Dodo case guys just took it exactly from, from right. there. Right. Um, These are like those kits those that we really do cool. with my kids on, on the Home Depot on the weekends. <laughs> I think that, really yes, like a birdhouse. I did that with my kid, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's no hammering involved here. You do need a neodymium ring magnet and a ceramic disc magnet and apparently uh, 45-millimeter focal length uh, lenses, which are hard to get. But uh, So I think, I think the, the Dodo case will save you some time. They also give you, know, you developer the, the documentation. So, and this is exciting. You can write your own apps for yeah, this stuff. Yeah, be a lot of good stuff yeah. out there. Yeah. And I, do I want think to of these wearables, though, is is really that the technology is there. What what we really are waiting for is is for them to become fashionable. Because a watch and glasses, these are accessories that you know. The technology companies are, are going so crazy to try and make them better and better. They're already okay. What we really need is for these to become desirable in terms of fashion. And maybe that's why we see so many executives from the fashion world now coming over to technology. And that's been an aim for many, many years now. There's been tech, HP has been working with Vera Wang for, you know, the, we've seen these partnerships, but it's not there yet. I don't want a Wi-Fi dress, but I really, I've been in the market <laughs> I do. for it. I do. You want a Wi-Fi dress? Yeah. <laughs> How about a Wi-Fi moo moo for your trip tomorrow? I need a yeah. like with why? Can I? Can uh, is it? Uh, does it go with me? Like the Wi-Fi follows me around in the dress? <laughs> I want that. I think that's yes. Good. Your your dress like is a Wi-Fi. We know you can order pizza because they demoed that on the stage with the Android. Way. Is is everybody just waiting? Yeah, I know what's going on here perfectly well. You're just waiting to see what Apple's going to do. I think that's part of that is is true. Yeah, yeah. I, I I want it to be better looking. I think I think you're gonna get the Burberry I watch. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I might. need it to be better looking. Actually, I need I need the stuff to work well. I yeah. want my car and my I really want this whole you know universe that we're just on the verge of of when. The car works the way you want it to. The you can know whether your lights are burned out and what your thermostat's doing and all that stuff. 
uh, it just sees easy and seamlessly. And I don't think we're quite there yet. Yeah. I, I, just the really, other day, really I had stuff. one of those little lights in my dashboard and I'm flipping through the stupid book and I'm like, why is the technology that I have yeah. to figure out what this light means? Yeah. Come yeah. on. It should just, yeah. Your phone, your watch could tell you that. I see Probably you have could. a light on. Yeah. Yeah. And so there are some things that they talked about as well when it comes to Android Auto, for example, if you have navigation open on your phone and you're directing somewhere and you plug your phone into your car, the car will basically pick up navigation right in your dashboard and, and take off where you left off effectively. But if you're not navigating and just plug your phone in, it won't uh, start navigating anywhere or it won't even take over the display of your car, for example. So there's some contextual stuff coming in there, which I think is interesting. And of course, with, with Nest kind of getting in the game, uh, I think we'll definitely see some uh, some good stuff when it comes to smart home integration as well. Uh, so I think there's a lot more contextual stuff that's going to be coming in the future. But yeah, right now the designs do leave a bit to be desired. These watches are all very big. I do think they don't look well. They don't look great on women's wrists on smaller wrists. They look no, pretty clunky. My wife is, is very eager to get a device like this, but uh, whenever I have one, she tries it on and it just looks kind of ridiculous on her, unfortunately. So <laughs> she's she's still waiting for. She can't for lift the one. her arm. It's, oh, but that yeah, was kind right. of the, the thing for a while was women in masculine watches. Yeah, that clunky. was in style. Yeah, for a while. so were shoulder pads. Too bad they missed mm. it. We've moved on, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's talk about auto because uh, it looks like what Google is doing is very similar to what uh, Apple's doing with uh, their, uh, what do they call it? Uh, uh, CarPlay. Car CarPlay. That they, they're casting it into the car. So what, right. since you're the car editor uh, over there at CNET, fill me in. What, what does the car have to do? I, Audi just announced, for instance, the 2015 models will support uh, uh, Android Auto. Right. Um, and, and this is another bit of uh, uh, fear, uncertainty, and data that's been thrown on this week is that your car will probably support both of these standards. There's a okay. lot of people saying that you might have to buy one car or another based on what phone you have, but it, that it's very likely that, that manufacturers will support both because ultimately, from a car manufacturer standpoint, they're very, very similar. All they need to do is basically run a very simple software stack in their cars and then provide a USB input and the means for video stream to come from your phone to your dashboard. And that's pretty much all that they need to provide, plus a couple of buttons and some other stuff. So CarPlay so works uh, basically the same as Android Auto? It's the same? Basically exactly the same thing. So that yeah. what the phone is doing is effectively rendering an external display and Got then it. that that content is showing up on your dashboard. And then voice commands and and uh, touchscreen or, or physical buttons, those stuff get then push back into your phone and that controls the apps. Um, so it's very much the same between the two. The big difference between CarPlay and Android Auto is that developers can get in the game when it comes to Android Auto. They cannot do that when it comes to CarPlay. Apple is basically locking things down and saying only our approved developers can write apps for CarPlay, at least for now. Android uh, and Google are giving developers the permission and the means to write apps, but in a very limited way. Right now, only media apps and messaging apps are allowed and again, as I said before, they had to fit into the standard templates that Google has defined. And those templates are approved based on uh, global standards for distracted driving and that sort of thing. So, for example, no single interaction with the app will take more than two seconds. Uh, th those are things that are globally accepted and those are things that are, are now approved and, and included within uh, the, the Android Auto standard. Now, there's another standard called MirrorLink, which does the same sort of thing. You plug in your Android phone, it connects and takes over the dashboard of your car. That allows developers to do anything that they want to. They can write any apps that they want to, but those apps need to be certified to run in the dashboard. So that's even more open than Google. But what, what Google didn't want to do is force developers to learn all these standards when it comes to button size and contrast and allowable fonts and things like that. There's a giant stack of, uh, of certifications that you can read if you really want to. Google said, we're going to you know, kind of get rid of all that stuff and just basically create a template that's allowable. And our devs had to fit within that. You got, it seems sense. like a lot of interaction with the screen uh, that it does that it kind of fosters distracted driving. I presume that they're going to be very careful about that. Yeah, they're, they're absolutely. Uh, I mean, GM and Audi and all the other forty members had a, a very big part in saying what exactly these okay. apps can look like, and so these apps are all basically going through the same sort of standardized testing that any of the the head units for a General Motors car, for example, would go through. They have to abide by the same rules and regulations as those things. So while, of course, the demonstrations that we've all been getting this week, you know, it shows a lot of people staring at these screens, hitting buttons right. and things That's like that. That scared me. Playing yeah. With it. yeah. Um, but anything can be done by voice. They can all be done by steering wheel controls as well. Okay. The car supports it. Uh, and there will never be more than, I think, about 10 buttons on screen at one time. They're all fairly large and they're all in the same place. So you can get muscle memory going too. Will the Google Voice now, capability be the same as it is on a phone? In other words, can I send a text and tweet? And I, you can re reply to text. I don't know if you can create a new text, though, that I'm not sure okay. about. So it may uh, not be the same capability. 
Right. And, uh, but you can do searches for content about, across apps too. Right. Maybe you describe this, but um, what about when you don't have a good connection when you're driving out in the sticks? Oh, you're Is that screwed. Kind of stall? You're going to get lost. <laughs> so you're your going to end up. Are, yeah, you're dead meat. Because so, the technology for a GPS is much different. You can actually right. get mapping when you don't have reception, but that's not the case with these mobile devices. It's well, a completely it, different it, mapping technology. It would be just like Google Navigation now, where you, if you have connection when you start and you lose connection along the way, that's fine because it'll cache the, the path that you're going along. Or if you downloaded that map to your phone locally, which you can do now, uh, you can then navigate within. Uh, the other thing that, that the system can do, because it talks to your car, it can actually pull GPS data from the car. It can pull speedometer data and oh. wheel position data from the car, oh. too. So, you know, if you're walking through the city or if you go through a tunnel with your phone, gets really confused because the, the GPS sensors and phones are pretty weak right. compared to a car. But if the car loses signal, the car can still get a pretty good idea of where it is based on where it knew where it was before and based on how fast and in what direction it's traveling. So even if you're driving through a tunnel, you'll still get better navigation through your car with your phone than if you just had your mm. phone out. I like that. Tim, can I ask mm. you a question? Do you think that car companies are going to embrace this because technology companies can do it better or do you think they'll get defensive because they have their own sorts of things they've been developing? Uh, they're going to embrace it very reluctantly, uh, but they don't really have much of a choice at this point. They've been trying to develop their own systems that would be better for years now, and ultimately they failed. And in fact, I've been interested to watch all the poaching from uh, these consumer tech companies that the auto manufacturers have been making, hiring a lot of mobile developers to, to help build their software and to improve their software. But, the, you know, when you're talking about software that goes into a car, the, the, the integration cycle on in those things is at least three years, more like five years most of the time. And so even if they, they're doing cutting edge stuff, it's three years away from showing up. And that's that's a problem. There, there are solutions to that. But the best solution is simply to take that stuff out of the car, put it in the phone, uh, and then you'll get a much better experience because that can be updated more easily. So the manufacturers know that that's what people want. Manufacturers don't really want to hand that control over. They want to control the dashboard as much as they want to control the shape of the steering wheel and the shape of the headlights and everything else. Uh, but this is something that people are really going to demand in the next probably 24 months from now. This is the, the sort of thing that people are going to expect from their cars. So GM and Ford and everybody else are going to reluctantly have to support it. They have to be very careful. They don't want legislatures. They don't want Congress to start passing laws about this stuff, though, because uh, of distracted driving. They've got to be really, really cautious. Yeah, that's the other thing, too. I spoke with manufacturers about that, too, and they are definitely afraid of that because they feel that that will stifle innovation. Absolutely. I think that that definitely would. Yeah. Um, so I think that they are taking the right steps, especially Apple with CarPlay and Google now with Android Auto. They're being very careful about making sure that these interfaces pass all the regulations that are out there and well-defined now. Right. And those right now are industry-defined regulations, but they are very comprehensive. So I hope that we don't see any more legislation coming because that would definitely throw a big old wrench in the works. So, Michael Klein, you stop watching Twit as you're driving up here on your... How did you get your Pioneer to do that? Did you hack it? No? Sort of? Sort of. I can show you later. Yeah. I, he's busted, except he tweeted it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know the Twitter is... It looks like that was uh, taken from the back seat, you need a warrant to read someone's Twitter feed? Over? It was from the back seat. That's right. He it wasn't driving. Read someone's Twitter feed. <laughs> very, very good. Very good. Very good. Uh, Google announced a lot of other stuff. This was a two and a half hour keynote that seemed like it would just never end. There's uh, the next generation of Android, Android L, with a beautiful design. I thought beautiful design uh, changes. Uh, looking forward to that. Um, Android TV, which is their third attempt, um, actually fourth if you include the the ill-fated Q, to uh, get TV, get Android in the living room. Um, I though thought there were a couple of things that they showed that maybe they didn't fully explain how they worked and I thought could be very interesting. One was the idea that you could use, forget Android TV, you could use your Chromecast to do a lot of the things that you would do with an Android TV, including cast applications, play games. It's unclear how they're going to do this, when they're going to do this, but uh, this is pretty neat. You can replicate your display, or you will be able to replicate your display to the Chromecast. And that's yeah. functionality that I was kind of shocked that they didn't include in the first place. Right. But they are bringing that now. I don't know if it'll be across every Wi-Fi chipset and every device that's out there. But that'll definitely make Chromecast a lot more usable, I think, for a lot of people. Also, you'll be able to cast to uh, somebody's Chromecast without joining their Wi-Fi network. And we've now learned that that's using mm. uh, uh, inaudible tones to authenticate with the Chromecast. Coming from your phone, the Chromecast is listening, apparently. That's really cool. It's getting that sync up with the Wi-Fi network. It's always a pain. Yeah. So now you can just sit on the curb and, and change somebody's channel. <laughs> uh, 
Um, th- I thought that was really neat. Apparently, Google acquired the uh, company that does this uh, uh, audio authentication um, last year, and this is uh, this is the technology they're using. Although they didn't mention that at all in the keynote, these ultrasonic. I love tones. Chromecast, but I feel like it's such a geek tool. You know, is are any real people using Chromecast? That's a good question. It seems so easy. You just put it in the HDMI port. You use your phone to set it up. Then you use your phone to find content, mm-hmm. and you cast it to your Chromecast, <laughs> which then receives it and puts it on your screen. What could be easier? Right. <laughs> it's only thirty five dollars. Yeah, yeah. No, there. I, I. The the normal people I know can't even figure out how to turn the TV on. So this is right. not. Much really... less where the HDMI ports are. Yeah. What yeah. is an HDMI port? Or right. My dad thinks it's up. HTML. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that no. thing that does the internet, the HTML, I got it on my TV now. It's amazing. They also showed, and I thought this could be huge. Again, they just did a little quickie. The ability to run some Android apps on your Chromebook. They showed Evernote, Flipboard, um, and I'm not sure, they didn't really say how this works, but it strikes me if you can do, if you can run Android apps on your Chromebook, they've added this kind of same app capability to Google Chrome, the browser on Windows and Mac. It's just a short amount of time before you can run Android apps on your Windows machine and your Mac machine as well. And that, this is really what the keynote was about. Android everywhere. Good mm-hmm. strategy for Google. Yeah, pretty obvious so. strategy. Yeah, maybe. I mean, they had Chrome OS too, but Android seems to be the killer. Um, it's, especially as they're trying to build dependence on things like Android Home and Android notifications. You know, you want that data to be everywhere that you are, uh, and so for them to be able to extend Android apps across all these platforms, I mean, you get more dependent on those Android apps, and as your accessibility and, and visibility into that data gets gets broader and easier to to access. And that means that, that you have more opportunities to use that data and you become ultimately more tethered to their to their ecosystem. That's good that's for ultimately Google. ultimately what they want. Absolutely. So yeah, I think it's absolutely great. And I think it's good for the users too. I mean, that, that simple example of getting weather in Detroit on my flight back was, was ultimately a useful thing. Not that I couldn't have gotten to that in some other way, but to have it right there on my wrist was pretty nice. Uh, and I think that's the kind of thing that we can just expect to see in the coming, coming years. Ben Thompson, uh, who's been on Twitter before and uh, really think the world of, he writes a blog called Stratechery and a newsletter pointed out there is a difference between Android on the phones and Android on other things like your wrist, mainly that phones are a must-have. Uh, the primary difference between a watch and your phone is you buy the former, the watch, by choice, and the latter by necessity. Um, and I think that's a very good point, that these other devices are more of a luxury item. They are, you can't expect them to dominate in the same way Android has dominated the phone market. And you can't even use your Android Wear watch without an Android smartphone right. or, or Android device of some sort. And I should clarify what was said before. The Samsung Android Wear watch will work with any Android 4.3 or above phone, oh. not just Samsung. Oh, you know what? Let me check because when I thought when I went to the, the Play Store, it said that it was Samsung phones only. So I must have misunderstood mm. that. But let me check Android Wear here. Let's just click this and look at the Samsung Gear Live. That's the watch. Um, and where did I see, maybe you're right, maybe you're right. I thought I saw text that says with any Samsung phone, but I guess that's not the case. So good. That's good news. I ordered the other one, but. Who, of know. course, throughout this whole discussion, I've been wondering about how the Supreme Court would think about your watch. Yeah. <laughs> Can they search your watch without a warrant? Yeah. <laughs> But it seems like these devices mostly push you information rather than you having stuff right. stored on there. Right. Well, let's say you're getting pulled over by an officer and your hand is on the steering wheel. And as the officer is talking to you, you get a notification on your wristwatch that says something that incriminates you. And the officer sees that. Mm-hmm. Is that probable cause in that case to search your phone? Well, if they if it's in plain sight, they don't need mm-hmm. a warrant. You know, if your mm. watch is there broadcasting, here's the picture of you with the crap. Ah, exactly. <laughs> you know, so turn off your smartwatch. And you get on a by the but do they need a warrant to swipe or can they just do they? Or, or... <laughs> to swipe. I think they should have to have a warrant to swipe. Yeah. If it, sure. if, if it Don't touch my watch. Deeper access. <laughs> I would think that it would, you know, again, this decision that 
just well, came out and deals with phones, but we'll there was a lot of good language in there indicating that, you yes. know, we have a lot of devices in our lives that have deep information about us far deeper than anything that we could keep in our pockets. <laughs> And uh, a watch may fall into that category. One thing Google really has to Speaking worry. Speaking of falling in, you can yes. hide it a lot easier. And there are a lot of cavities in your body to put it yeah. in your pockets. <laughs> and, you know, you can get creative if you're really that nefarious. I'm just saying. Next time you see Becky <laughs> Worley, like she has a story about that. You should ask. Just next time you see Becky Worley, just say, where's the strangest place you ever saw somebody hide a watch? And just let her, <laughs> <laughs> let her talk. It's, you'll, you won't believe it. <laughs> okay then <laughs> you gotta think like a criminal if you're gonna think like a criminal be ahead in this yep. world right yep not that you actually exercise these things but yep. you're always one step ahead plan ahead avoid circumcision that's all i'm saying our mm -hmm. uh our um uh, yeah <laughs> okay okay you know what i'm saying here it's time right to come now. out of that rat hole yeah time to, time to move on i think we've covered uh andrea the only thing i wanted to ask is if the creepy factor, where are we on the creepy factor with Google? Is this, because really this is moving Google more towards a world where instead of you searching, it pushes to you the information it thinks you want on your wrist, in your glasses, uh, in your car, uh, in your TV set. Um, yeah. Have we raised the creepy factor or not? But what Google user is going to be like, oh my gosh, they, they know who's emailing me and who's calling me and texting. Like what, we expect this of Google. I, I, I don't think any of this was like, whoa, that's above and beyond. I think was, was there any one thing there? No. Even fitness stuff. This is so much more innocuous than Google Health, with which everyone was pissed off about. Like, I, I think they've dialed it. By back. the way, they're bringing that yeah. back, but it, you're right; it's not. They're not going to violate any FDA rules or need even FDA mm. permission for this new stuff. I, I um, Farhad Manju talked to Larry Page and Sundar Pichai after the keynote, and there's a really good bits blog post on this. And one of the things he did ask about uh, was creepiness, um, and he says, do you worry the more devices we have that are connected to Google, there's not just a privacy question, but also something like creepiness. Paige, I think, had the right answer. He says, um, as long as we make these things useful, it people will accept them. He says, the problem is when we talk about things before people see them, there's a much more negative reaction. It's really important for people to be able to experience products Otherwise, you fear the worst without seeing the benefits. That seems sensible to me. If you can see Google Now and the value of Google Now and use it, it won't bug you as much as if you just hear about this idea that Google will tell you, oh, hey, there's a great deer on pizza down the street, and I know you like pepperoni, so let's go. Right? Is that? Do you think that he's fair on that? I think so, I think and I think that's fair. part of... What makes that Facebook uh, research study seems partly bad because there ultimately was no there was no net benefit for right. Facebook users coming out of that study, right. and that's why I think there was so much such a, a negative reaction from that. Whereas with all the the predictive predictive search things we're getting out of Google, uh, those are helpful things, and so therefore we're getting a service from. It. He's saying the right words. He says, "I'm not this is Larry Page again. I'm not trying to minimize the issues. For me, I'm so excited about the possibilities to improve things for people. My worry." actually would be the opposite. We get so worried about these things, we don't get the benefits. I think that's what's happened in healthcare. We decided, largely through regulation, that data is so locked up that it can't be used to benefit people well. We don't mine data mine healthcare data. If we did, though, we could save 100,000 lives next year. I believe that. That's interesting. Yeah, and I think the other piece of this is is the other shoe to drop from the Riley decision. There's a lot of speculation about, well, you know, if the court is recognizing that uh, we have this strong privacy information on our phones and the information that can be accessed from our phones, you know, how much protection does the cloud have and is the NSA surveillance constitutional? And I think that's, that's a strong piece of how much people are going to trust cloud services you know if you're putting all your information there who gets to see it who gets to use it page says he's worried that the media and governments are stoking people's fears and that we'll end up in a state where we could benefit a lot of people but we're not able to do that now that's a little self-serving this is larry page from last year where he said i wish there were an island we could go to <laughs> and then maybe maui yeah i'll meet you there larry um, street view it street view it 
Um, no, no mention of Google Plus, no mention of Google Glass, no mention of Google Home or any, any home initiatives. Doesn't mean they're not doing it. In fact, Paige in this article says, no, we're all in on Google Plus. We're very happy with it. Um, I think that this was a long enough keynote there. <laughs> it's been a long enough segment. <laughs> we're going to talk about the Facebook case. I, uh, I think there's a few more things to talk about before we wrap things up. You know, before we uh, go to the ad, though, and by the way, I, I really want to thank you, Anthony, for filling in for Chad Johnson. Chad is on vacation. He's, he went to Birmingham for, a, I think, a Minecraft, Minecraft convention. So um, got Anthony Nielsen filling in. But before we go to the ad, Anthony, let's see what we uh, well, let's see what you missed. If you missed anything on Twitter this week, it was a good week. Previously on Twit. Unbelievable! <laughs> oh boy. Tech news tonight. <laughs> Google <laughs> I/O developer conference, of course, and here is the one and only Jeff Jarvis. The phrase that really resonated with me today was talking about the wearables. Now. Computer, you can wear a computer on your body all day. This week in law. Oh, Aereo pretty much is done. I think what you see here is some issues about the court trying to deal with this new technology through this method of analogy. I really don't think we should be all that surprised if we can take as a given that the court wanted to see this as a cable company from the beginning. This week in Google. For years, Android did feel a little ill-designed, a little clunky. These new tools are obviously designed to address that. I think that the complaint that Android is just not as pretty, or not as aesthetically pleasing, I think that that's, that's a done deal. Matt Break Weekly. I'm really starting to believe that there's going to be a normal-sized phone that's larger than an iPhone, and also one that's kind of like a Pop-Tart. <laughs> Twit. It's free when you watch from work. <laughs> You've discovered something very odd. <laughs> No one makes tech fun like Chad and Leo on twite.tv. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my oh, goodness. Awesome. Uh, hey, did uh, I don't know if Mike, did he? He did not. Okay, so uh, normally we would say here's what's coming in the week ahead. We're so exhausted from the week gone by that we're just going to forget it. I don't know if there's anything coming up. I'm not even going to be here. It's a holiday week anyway. It is. The 4th of July. Let's just relax, set off fireworks, explode things. If you're not in the United States, you could explode things anyway because it's the 4th of July here. And uh, all, all bets are off. Our show today brought to you by Personal Capital. Uh, really a clever idea. I talked to its founder, Bill Harris, on Triangulation a couple of years ago, and he was looking for a way to help people make better sense of their financial life so they can make better decisions for their future. And he's come up with this great, free, secure tool that is so cool. It's personal capital, and it helps you in a couple of ways. First of all, of course, it's hard to keep track of all your all your finances, your stocks, your investments, your charge cards, your bank accounts, your, your, your property, all the things that you've got. They're all on different websites with different logins. Personal capital collates it all in a single page with easy to use, easy to understand graphs and information. And then, of course, it helps you analyze what you're doing. Are you paying too much for financial advice? Have you allocated your assets properly? Are you invested properly so that you can retire when that time comes? Some of, uh, some of you are young enough that you're probably not thinking about that. Now is the time. In fact, I told Chad that, and Chad's been using, I think he's been using personal capital. Now is the time to start thinking about retirement because if you start putting stuff aside now and you do it right, you won't have to worry. Um, I love personal capital. Signing up is, just takes a minute. It'll pay big dividends right away. Total clarity, transparency, make better investment decisions. And by the way, it, if you do use their financial advisors, they are not on commission. They're all certified financial planners. They're fee-based, but you don't have to use them. It's absolutely free. Personalcapital.com slash twit. It's a smart way to grow your money. And I strongly suggest you sign up and try it today. I've been using it for two years, ever since I talked to Bill, and I'm thrilled with it. It's just really, really great. Do you know how your 401k is doing this year? Do you know? Maybe not. Maybe you should. Personalcapital.com slash twit. Uh, okay, the crumbs. I don't know if I even want to mention this story about Tim Cook. I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm going to take the high ground. Who the hell cares? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I don't care. It's stupid. And I don't even know no. why it's a story. Of course, now I've everybody going, what, what, what did they say? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Google uh, it. It's none of our business. It's That's none of our said. freaking business. <laughs> That's right. Um, let's talk about the Facebook thing, because I, I think maybe I'm uh, upset for no good reason. It turns out Facebook participated in a study, an interesting study. Uh, about how 
what you see on social media affects your feelings. And it turns out that uh, in, I think it was January 2011, for one week, Facebook intentionally manipulated the news feeds for 700,000 users. They gave half of them uh, happy stories, half of them sad stories, and then a week later monitored their posts to see if they were happier or sadder. And surprise, surprise, people who saw depressing sad stories were more depressed. And people who saw happy-go-lucky stories were happier. First of all, what a waste of time. That's obvious, but okay. This was, by the way, Cor uh, Cornell was involved in this. Uh, I think uh, uh, California University involved in this study. Uh, experimental evidence of massive scale emotional contagion through social networks published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of the Sciences uh, of the USA. But Princeton University, was uh, a, a woman who edited it from Princeton even said, the creepy factor was off the scale here. Is it in normally in research when you do this kind of research you get the consent of the subject? You may not say what you're going to do, but you say we're going to do a research study. Uh, just want to make sure it's okay with you. And when you don't, you have to get consent from a review board. That and this study did, which yeah, but you know what the review board on. was? It was Facebook's own review board. It was an in, it was a local <laughs> institutional review board. Oh, so it wasn't Facebook. I don't think it was Facebook. I think they they went through the proper How social did this happen? science channels. You, you have to. Don't you feel like published. this is incredibly invasive? And yes, and and messed up. I want to use a stronger word, but I'll use the messed word. Messed up. Yes, I think it is, because how to, much different is this than the Stanley Milgram experiment, which was that was the messed impetus. up. Yeah, that was the impetus of review boards. That's why we have them is because when you manipulate someone's psyche to think the world is one way that it is not, it has lasting effects on them, even if it's something as stupid as your news feed. This is, as the researchers pointed out, part of Facebook's terms of service. Yeah. <laughs> and it that's is. what I was going to say. Don't, yeah, don't anybody think that it's illegal. It's not I'm illegal. sure they covered themselves on that front. <laughs> Yes, this is this is what Facebook that said. And legality are two different things. Yes, unethical right. maybe, legal absolutely. When users sign up for Facebook, they agree their information may be used for quote internal operations, including. I hope you read this carefully: troubleshooting, mm -hmm. data analysis, testing, research, 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 and service improvement. Uh, now, of course, the other point to be made is that Facebook is constantly manipulating the newsfeed in ways that we don't know. Who knows what the hell they're up to? This makes me want to quit Facebook so bad. And they did this two Again. years ago, which is also disconcerting to me. In, there was a statement posted just about an hour ago from one of the uh, data engineers from Facebook uh, kind of explaining things a little bit better and apologizing and saying that they wish that they had been a little bit more communicative and transparent for the reasoning. But he said, you know, we've learned a lot and grown a lot in the past two years, so we're better at this now. But still, there was been two years of this sort of activity, and that's I'm wondering what other studies are still in the pipeline and haven't even been published yet. Um, but I, I do agree that I think that they were not acting ethically here, but to play devil's advocate, how is this different than a website using an A-B test to decide which headline they should run for a given story? I'll throw that out there. Well, I can tell you one thing. Facebook got sued over Beacon. They're going to get sued over this. Good. I hope they do. I think they will. I mean, Professor James Grimmelman, who is far more knowledgeable about this sort of thing uh, than I would ever pretend to be, uh, has said, you know, if you're exposing people to something that causes changes in psychological status, that's experimentation and requires informed consent. Uh, should, anyway. So, I mean, he's just kind of spitballing as a law professor, but if he's spitballing as a law professor, there are plaintiff's lawyers out there who are putting it in pleadings and uh, probably thinking about filing. As a class does action? That mean, I don't I, I that, mean, the Beacon Because you case wouldn't know it. if you were uh, part of the 700,000, right? How would you know that? Right. Uh, if you're I not, just was though, really sad control. January 2011. <laughs> I was so sad for a week. <laughs> And all of my, yeah, I don't know. You'd have to go through and say, 
assuming you'd even have a record of what was I just shown think to this you on Facebook then. Is, uh, the only takeaway on this is a little peek under the curtain uh, at how Facebook runs its business, how they are ethically, how they feel about you as a Facebook user, and just, you know, understand we've learned something here. Uh, just... <sighs> I don't know. I always well, feel bad well, when I visit I mean, Facebook. I just feel crappy afterwards. I feel like I should take a shower. Do now, people think that A-B testing is a psychological experiment, too? Because ultimately you're trying to influence someone's psyche to get them to click. Uh, and you're using different headlines to, to basically influence their it's decision. It's no different than you go to a restaurant and the chef says, do you like this or this? Is where the, uh, the eye doctor says A or B. It's just you giving somebody a choice. And the choice isn't explicitly requested or explicitly given but you just see, well, do people like this site or that site? That does not feel as manipulative as somebody modifying the news feed to try to make me happy or sad. That seems right. really Right, and, and these up. researchers had to go to Facebook and say, our hypothesis is that, that it will. The, the emotional content of your Facebook feed will affect your emotional content, your emotional response. So we intend to manipulate this in order to elicit emotional responses from your participants. And that is very different than just seeing what color looks best on your banner, wouldn't Here's, you say? I, I don't yes. know. I mean, isn't that the same thing as an editor going to to another editor saying, I believe that if we change the headline to be this structure, that we'll get more people to click on it. So therefore, let's run both using uh, some optimizing software with A-B a testing capabilities, and we'll see which one is more effective. And therefore, they're going to learn which is more effective. Again, I'm playing devil's advocate here, but I, effective I am Effective is a different thoughts. thing because this these authors have specified to Facebook that we would like to emotionally manipulate your users and they said yes it's not a matter of which ones you know get the most clickbait which I agree does happen but when once Facebook but you're got physically this, motivating got the user abstract, if they have to take the mouse then and they on should it. have said no well the good news is fewer than one tenth of one percent of the users committed suicide so it's okay <laughs> no, I don't know but that's a legitimate question what if somebody got so depressed they they, you know, they harmed themselves because of this stupid study. Then what's the liability? And, and there's one other thing out of this is that I'm not sure that they actually proved anything because if you indeed you're seeing sad news, you might say, oh, I'm really sorry to hear about that. And then ultimately you right. are contributing you to their sad. research. But that doesn't necessarily mean that yeah. you're actually any sadder yourself. Right. Yeah, it's dumb. The whole thing is dumb. <laughs> and by the way, you mentioned, Natalie, I did quit Facebook once. I wish I weren't on Facebook, but I feel like I, I have to use it so I can report on stories like this. Yeah, I, need yeah. to, I need to have an experience. <clears throat> so I'm taking the hit for you. How That's, did this come to taking light? it for the team. I'm taking one for the team. I don't want to use Facebook. He's taking a profile for the team. You know what I did give up, though? And I'm very proud of myself. That stupid Simpsons tapped out. <laughs> it's taken a while. It, well, it was, you know, I was really hooked on it for a while, and then Electronic Arts crashed it. And I was actually relieved. For six months, I couldn't use it. Then all of a sudden, Lisa said, oh, your, your, your tapped out seems to be back. I went, oh, no. Oh, no, they keep pulling me in. <laughs> and I, for the last month, it's been about a month, I've been doing it. And I realized that it's like an hour a day I'm farming and tapping. So I'm very proud of myself. I just deleted, and Lisa did too. We deleted our Simpsons tapped out. Because Farmville 2 is coming. And I really want to have room on the iPad. For, no, just kidding. <laughs> I, did someone out Facebook or did they out themselves on this research thing? The, the, the paper was published. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Somebody started reading this. What? You did what? Now yeah. all of the, you know, I think there will be more. Uh, we will hear more so, about this. you know, people need to vote with their feet if they don't want to be yeah, I would. I want on. to vote with my feet. I want to quit Facebook. I think this is ridiculous. Finally. I'm not going to. Blubber. <laughs> I would like to. Blubber has set a new world record. He played the entire Soupy Mar Super, Soupy, Super Mario <laughs> Brothers game under five minutes, four minutes, 57.69 seconds, beating the previous speed run by four tenths of a second. It is, ladies and gentlemen, an official world record. Congratulations to Blubber. Thank God he doesn't play Simpsons Tapped Out. <laughs> <laughs> we could watch. We could sit and watch this for. It's only five minutes. Seems like that's slowing him down. Like the the load is slowing him down. They didn't say what platform he played this on. That is just weird. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, with a name like Blubber, are you surprised? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Denise Howell. We appreciate it every week.
This Week in Law is, you know, a, sa a voice for sanity and understanding how all this stuff works. And I am so grateful to you for doing that every week. Um, and especially when things like Aereo uh, happen. So I appreciate your being here, Denise. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And and please, people, realize that uh, The Internet's Own Boy, the movie documentary oh, yes. history of Aaron Swartz, came out on Friday and is available for everyone to watch, and everyone should watch it. Is it on is Netflix? It is it Where can we see it? Uh, Amazon and Vimeo and uh, I think iTunes. Um, so, and, and $6 if you donated to the Kickstarter campaign, you probably already um, have the ability to watch yeah. it on Vimeo. So... Um, amazing, amazing film. Um, incredibly important to pay attention to organizations like the EFF and Public Knowledge and the Center for Democracy and Technology and the Electronic Privacy Information Center and all of these great advocacy groups that are out there um, trying to make sure that our rights are protected and that laws work the way they're supposed to as, as they didn't in Aaron Swartz's case. Such a sad story and uh, yeah. such a loss, frankly, to all of us. Um, yeah. Thank you, Denise, for reminding Sorry, me. Sorry, don't I, mean to put a downer at the end of the show. But no, I wanted to plug this, and I'm so glad you uh, yeah. remembered because it really is a, a big deal. The Internet's own boy. Uh, you can search for it. You can buy it for 6 bucks, 7 bucks on uh, Amazon and other places, um, and it's well worth seeing. And it's not a downer. It's sad what happened, but I think it's important to understand it. Definitely. Uh, thank you so much, Natalie Morris, for being here. She is You're at welcome. NBC. Anything you want to plug besides that fabulous Read Quick application? Uh, read quick is it we got a new promo up that you might want to oh, watch that, that explains the the speed reading app for ios and uh yeah that's about it read quick app.com and the promo is the demo video so people can watch this and understand um i don't think it's up on the site yet i'll give you a, i'll put a youtube video in the chat we'll put it up it'll be up by the time <laughs> by the time you it's, see this we just finished it good yeah. exciting okay. when you say we you, you mean you and me. you and clayton yeah, we were a big team of two. You go in the backyard and you do a little video, maybe some action figures, that kind of no, thing. No, our faces. We don't use the money makers. <laughs> it's, it's animated. <laughs> the money makers we keep for ourselves. Thank you, Natalie. Always a pleasure. Really. Yeah, thanks for letting me play, you guys. It's always fun to talk oh, about the news, and this you. was a good week to join in. Yeah, sure was. Yes. Thank you. Tim Stevens, automotive editor at CNET. He's actually editor at large. He covers whatever the hell he wants to cover. And, That's very uh, true, and, and I'm excited to announce that um, I'm going to be doing a video series on the Google Lunar X Prize this summer, which is going to be uh, debuting on Tuesday, and I'm going to be on CBS this morning, Tuesday morning, with oh. the president of X Prize to talk about it. So if Fun. you happen to have a TV through Aereo or otherwise, uh, I would uh, recommend you tune in and check it out. All I get on Aereo now is... <laughs> 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 thank you, Tim, Natalie, uh, Denise. Thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks to a great live studio audience. Always a pleasure. If you want to be in our studio audience, email tickets at twit.tv. We'll put a chair out for you. And maybe if we can get in a few more of these cardboard boxes, we'll put something under the chair. That would be kind of fun. Uh, but if you uh, – and we always like you watching live on the Internet at uh, live.twit.tv. We do the show Sunday afternoons, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern time, 2200 UTC. And if you're in the chat room at irc.twit.tv, we can have interactions. We can talk. We can be part of the same thing. If you uh, can't watch live, though, don't worry, because we make on-demand audio and video available on filmon.com. No, and <laughs> twit.tv and uh, wherever podcasts are appropriately and legally aggregated for distribution to your device. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to take the week off next week. Father Robert Balasser will fill in for me. Is that right? Yep. He'll be doing the show. And uh, I'll be back the following week. I'm going to, I'm here today, but I'm gone to Maui. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Another twit. This is amazing. Bye-bye.